Um, so I wanted to introduce Lila. Uh, Dr. Lila Lee Morrison is a writer, scholar, and art historian specializing in visual cultures of machine vision. Her broader research focuses on the intersection of art and technology, di digital culture, the history of scientific photography, art theory, and the agency of the image. Since September 2023, Morrison is a postdoctoral researcher on the ERC-funded research project Show and Tell, Scientific Representation, Alg Algorithmically Generated Visualizations, and Evidence Across em Epistemic Cultures at Lund University. She's also a member of the research cluster Art and Earth at University of Copenhagen and a 2023 recipient of the Andy Warhol Arts Writers Grant, as well as a visiting fellow at University of Copenhagen with Intersect, an interdisciplinary community. She's written for Art Forum, Media and Environment Journal, and been published by MIT Press, Liverpool University Press, and Brill Publishing. Um, for those of you coming in later, you can also find her bio back in our um, conference guide. Welcome to the stage, Lila. Hi, I'm Lila Lee Morrison. Um, thank you so much, Karen, for inviting me and for all the organizers of this Studium Generale. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been to Amsterdam and to this museum, and um, I'm so honored to be included and be able to present on some research I have done. Um, this research that I'm presenting today culminated my PhD dissertation that ended up being published as a book in 2019. And um, it's really exciting to try to, to talk about this in this uh, context of techno diversity that is the subject of today's theme. Um, on the subject of techno diversity and technology and its material impact, I'm here to present a little about how this relates to the subject of automated facial recognition. Coming from the field of art history and visual culture, I've been interested in the visuality and cultures of machine vision, its modes of perception, specifically in how it may redefine the subjects and or objects under its gaze, the ways in which it comes to define an understanding of contemporary visuality, and how its processes may link to historical practices of representation with the inter within the intersection of art and science, and how a critical inquiry from outside the field of development of these technologies mainly cultural, uh, cultural studies and the humanities, may contribute to the knowledge we have around this technology, its success and failures, and how they invoke, um, and how they also invoke contemporary ways of seeing. So, in relation to this, obviously it's related very much to the film that we just saw of Harun Faraki. Um, and my presentation today is kind of going backwards um, uh, in temporality, uh, in terms of understanding and critically examining this technology. So automated facial recognition is for me one case study of a form of machine vision implemented in society with socio-political and cultural implications. An important aspect concerning the development and advent of the phenomenon of machine vision is the technical translation and performance of vision by machines, including AI and algorithmic forms of perception, and how its processes redefine the role of images within a specific context. The nature of images has had to be radically expanded in face of the advent of machine vision in terms of what they do, how they, re how they are read, understood, and communicate information. And so I'm just going to begin with a brief discussion in terms of like a theoretical uh, entry into understanding machine vision and what has been referred to as the machinic, uh, machinic vision. And um, so I'm going to just, ooh, sorry. <laughs> okay, skip over to uh, the term of machinic vision as it was defined by John Johnston. 
where he draws on the work of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's notion of the machinic assemblage as, quote, what John Johnston defines as, quote, an environment of interacting machine and human machine systems, a field of decoded perceptions that whether or not produced by or issuing from these machines, assume their full intelligibility only in relation to them, end quote. Johnston further describes a vision that is taken out of its fixed and situated position, that is grounded within the human sensing body and re-territorialized, using the words of Deleuze, through technical processes, which, as he describes, liberates the sense perception of vision and reframes it within different objects and embodying different forms. Interestingly, he gives the example of a machinic vision that can take the form of, of gaseous, for example, in which he refers to paintings by Francis Bacon as a representative example, as something that can move around and be more atmospheric. And at scales beyond the human, such as in a macro form, as particleized. Another framing of this theoretical understanding of machine vision includes an approach by Jonathan Crary in his study of the historical relationships between technologies and seeing with a specific focus on the role of the observer. He states, quote, for the problem of the observer is the field on which vision in history can be said to materialize, to become itself visible. Vision and its effects are always inseparable from the possibilities of an observing subject who is both the historical product and the site of certain practices, techniques, institutions, and procedures of subjectification, end quote. So this focus on the observer as being like the site of how we understand vision to be materialized is interesting to think about when we consider an algorithm designed by computer scientists uh, and what kinds of logics direct the operation of seeing. The logics become the field in which vision materializes then and produces the techniques of subjectification, which I will get more into when, we, uh, an when I analyze facial recognition technologies. So these narratives frame an inquiry of an analysis of machine vision as invoking new paradigms of ways of seeing that I argue is really necessary to kind of understand what modes of vision and perception can be defined as in our contemporary society. And they're brought about through technological advancements of machine vision systems. So, um, okay, sorry about this. Hmm. Okay. I realize that my uh, PowerPoint is an old one, but that's okay. So Haroon Faraki, as we just saw in his film, I Machine One, um, one of the things that I really appreciate of that film is how avid of an observer he is of the role and shifts uh, that images play in society. What we see is the juxtaposition of images used in um, industrial factories for inspection, and then that juxtaposed with uh, images of uh, automated images from a missile hitting its target. And that juxtaposition, juxtaposition to me uh, really kind of signals this movement of military logics of targeting out into wider society in terms of its, uh, through the image and through technologies of machine vision in which inspection and targeting are now applied towards uh, different objects or subjects of mobility within wider society through kind of mass uh, surveillance systems that have, are increasingly implemented today. The narration in the film states, quote, industrial production abolishes manual work, always referring back to this kind of industrial logics of mass production, um, moving out of that factory context into wider society. What I think Faraki is also stating here is that not only does industrial logics abolish manual work, but it starts to uh, replace sense work. Uh, labor of looking, for example, the sense perceptions that we utilize in our, through our own bodies being now kind of turned into a, a, a kind of uh, automated operation. In many of Faraki's film, filmic works, he studies the role of images and uh, he coins this term as was described by, so well by Karen about the operational image. And you know, this has been such a um, influential term 
the last, I don't know, decade, you could say, it's gotten so much attention by so many different scholars in different fields because it really kind of addresses this um, role of the relation or tension between data, information, and images. And also what I think the operational image um, describes is this shift of uh, you know, the role of the image as a representation instead moving towards uh, facilitating an operation and having a certain level of agency that was, you know, has historically been ascribed to photographs, for example, but really in this term, like affecting material relations, physical relations out in the world. Um, and so here, you know, you can see this kind of juxtaposition between uh, the machinic eye applied to individuals in a kind of public space um, in relation to targeting logics. And so I'm gonna move on to this image here. So this was an image that came across uh, my radar when I started to look into biometric technologies uh, during my PhD studies. And I, I saw this image and I thought, you know, this is an operational image, right? It is something that struck me because um, it, it was an image where it kind of unblack boxed this process of an algorithmic facial recognition system called Eigenface, uh, which was developed in 1991 and was considered one of the first successful facial recognition technologies. And this image was to uh, show computer scientists that were developing this algorithm to kind of fix the bugs within the system and its process of recognition. But when I first saw this image, I, I thought it was such a paradoxical image in terms of how um, it kind of opposes all the forms of recognition that for me, I would need in terms of uh, recognizing an individual's face, right? Because it's not sharp. It's completely blurry. Like all the things that I would need to recognize an individual are, are not here in this image. And um, so it, it, it kind of piqued my curiosity in terms of what, it, what is happening here? What's happening for the algorithm that this is the image or this is how the algorithm is seeing a face and recognizing a face? And I was struck so much by its blurriness. Um, but what is happening here is that as part of the eigenface process, it produces this phantom-like blur of multiple overlapped faces that for human vision lingers on the threshold of recognition. And just to go back a little bit, I mean, to explain what biometrics is, uh, just you know, kind of a brief background, is that um, biometrics has been with us for a very long time, but in its contemporary form, it's, uh, a, it's designed through algorithmic uh, technologies and in its digital form. And it could be understood as a case of machine vision with its scope turned towards the human body. The function of biometrics is to recognize and identify individuals through a process of visually mapping and measuring parts of the body that are individual to the body, um, to the individual. And the political context of its application can most often be found at border controls and in conjunction with government surveillance. Its use is increasingly linked to defining an individual in regard to their societal and national status and the rights, obligations, and mandates which go along with it. There's been a lot of really rich, diverse work from different scholars that are examining and critically ex analyzing biometric technologies, such as Irma van der Ploeg and Eugene Thacker, who discuss how biometric technologies collapse the spaces of subjectivity when the body itself becomes the ID card and the site of verification. But also, the media and communication scholar John Durham Peters, in his outlining of a critical history of the term information, when he's, he states that, quote, information is in its contemporary form is knowledge with the body taken out of it. My inquiry responds to this and asks, well, what happens when that information is issuing from and is about the body? So facial recognition being one example of a biometric technology um, differs from other biometrics in that it registers a part of the body which is fully visible in everyday life. It is the only biometric that can be registered without the illicit permission or cooperation of the subject. 
This is often considered a non-invasive operation since it requires no active cooperation from the target. But it also places facial recognition systems in a position of threatening civil liberties since it can accrue information without consent, placing it in asymmetrical visual relationship that can be termed the non-collaborative mode where the person on camera does not know of its existence and thereby, thereby incurs no engagement. It has also become the most prominent biometric in the war on terror because often the only existing biointelligence collected on known or suspected terrorists is a photograph of their face. So as is perhaps obvious, the face and representations of the face have taken a new prominence in this contemporary age of virtual identities and online engagement. In conjunction, many of you are probably already aware that all online content is provi provides the major training data of image recognition algorithms. In regards to the face, it's the same proliferation of uh, selfies and other online content regarding the face. So for example, you see often like these kind of um, uh, viral sort of um, prompts across social media where people are asked to post a picture of their face 20 years ago. And this is like such prime um, training data for an algorithm to track and trace like how a face ages. And so these prompts are often like, I think just directly um, started by, you know, facial algorithmic, algorithmic uh, computer scientists um, or corporations rather that are developing them. So uh, these digital representations of the face has provided training data for the development of AFR, or automated facial recognition systems, again, without any direct consent or knowledge of those who are providing that information or data. And so back to this um, algorithm that was developed called Eigenface in the 1990s. Um, as I said, it was considered the first successful automated facial recognition algorithm. Um, it's it's been a long time, but for a while it was considered the benchmark for all development of AFR technologies. And now it's often used to train um, computer science students who are learning how to develop algorithms. But I think it's a really interesting case study because it kind of exposes some of the very bare structures of how facial recognition systems are, um, are designed and like kind of the skeleton of, of their design. And um, Eigenface is like a holistic image-based algorithm involving an image-based approach to recognition. That is, it begins with the picture of the face and ends with a conversion of those pictures into digital data or code. Eigenface, Eigenface and facial recognition is in general a high-level task in machine vision, as the face is complex, multidimensional, and its possibilities of expression can produce meaning on many profound levels. In other words, the human face is hard to quantify, unlike geometric shapes found in the industrial factory. It stands in direct opposition to the spectrum of forms that have generally been within the scope of machine vision research, usually objects of finite and mathematical form. So I just want to briefly describe the process of recognition um, in Eigenface. The algorithm process begins with a training set created from a set of multiple faces, some training sets include varying degrees of lighting and expression for one face. Images are low res, such as 200 by 180 pixels. If the images are originally in color, everything is converted to grayscale in order to be able to reduce the image into purely light and shadow values. From the layering of these multiple faces, an average is then calculated. The average, or what is also called the mean face, can be understood as the center of gravity of all the faces combined. This averaging process is done by averaging the value of each pixel across the facial images. In mathematical terms, this statistical process is called principal component analysis, or PCA. This process is often found in pattern recognition, which is a cornerstone of machine vision. The process involves extracting the principal components of the faces, which can account for all the variation. In other words, having the highest eigenvalues. The face with the highest eigenvalues, also called eigenvectors, or was, or was also termed ghost faces uh, by two computer scientists, Karichi and Erzin, in 2012. All of this parlance is very fascinating to me as a scholar within the humanities. And 
how they refer constantly to this sort of um, ephemeral uh, face that emerges from the average. And these eigenvectors can be thought of as having the most prominent direction in which the facial images may vary. Multiple eigenvector, eigenvectors result from multiple training sets. The compilation of these eigenvectors create a subspace, which is called the face space. Also love that term. Conceptually, this face space, I mean, it's understanding like the face as a space and space as a face. And I just, I just love this sort of understanding of a, a, of a zone of just face. And conceptually, the face spaces are supposed to encompass all possibilities of facial um, variation. And I'm just gonna show you a few examples of a couple of face spaces that were created by uh, different, different computer scientists. One, this was created by a student at Brown University. Um, and you can see that the eigenvector with the highest eigenvalues, which is at the farthest corner on the uh, left side, is rendered almost completely black. This tells you that the greater values have the possibility for making the least visually coherent eigenvectors. Um, and this was, uh, again, this, the production of this image was really for the computer science, scientists to understand, like to fix any bugs. And the um, abstraction that you can see here of these faces are made because the, um, the contrast was made too high. But I particularly enjoyed this face space because of this this kind of uh, strong abstractions that were made um, from the average faces, and it created kind of this painterly aesthetic um, of a face space. And the second face space was uh, developed by a computer scientist called Vincent, Vincent Scheib. And um, again, the first eigenvector is the average of all the faces on the left, and the second eigenvector captures the top left. The second eigenvector captures the overall variation and brightness of the faces in the picture. The third and fourth captures variation of the direction from which the faces were illuminated. And the fourth captures variation of face shape. Um, the display of the eigenvector to us, that is to human vision, is what is called the eigenface. The recognition process then involves projecting a captured image of the individual which needs to be identified onto the face space. A comparison is made through calculating the Euclidean distances, that is this distance from a kind of center average between the eigenface and the capture. It is these distances which are then expressed in numerical values and create a data set which then represents a person's identity and entered into the database. If there is a small distance, there can be a match. If there is a large distance, then there is no match. In the latter case, where there is no match, the face gets enveloped into the algorithm, adding a new variation within the face space. While the eigenface remains blurry to human vision, it holds a wealth of information that equates to a form of clarity for the processes of perception by the algorithm. When the eigenface image is of, uh, what the eigenface image is, is of a per perceptual logic. At the core of this logic is the merging of statistics and vision as it culminates in a representation of faces. And yet, this is not new. And so I just wanna take a brief moment to describe a kind of method of which I started to critically examine this particular process, this algorithm of eigenface, and through specifically the image output of this algorithm. And here I'm just gonna reference the African studies and surveillance scholar Simone Brown, who has called for what she terms a critical biometric consciousness, which includes ways of developing critical strategies that can reveal and allow us to scrutinize the technical development and socio-cultural implications of biometric technology. Central to this call is an approach to biometric technologies that contrasts with its treatment as being objective, neutral, like m most technologies, and without history. This approach is directly opposed to the widely held belief that algorithms and biometric scanning exist as privileged ahistorical practices of information technology that are objective and precise, a belief that validates the continued development and use of these technologies. 
Brown describes one method of developing a critical biometric consciousness as tracing historical practices and antecedents that inform the social dynamics and technical development of contemporary biometric technologies. This method of historicization has two great kind of uh, examples in scholarly work that I often also reference and kind of get a lot of inspiration from, which is uh, the book Objectivity by Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison, and also, as I mentioned earlier, John Durham Peter's work on the term information in his article, Information Notes Towards a Critical History. Both of these works pursue a method of historicization that traces cultural meaning behind the practice-based terms of objectivity and information as a means of demystifying their contemporary position as transparent and omnipresent idols and grounding their meaning in actual use and in modes of discourse. Like the scientific illustrations that appeared at the turn of the last century, recent technological developments and processes of information production are often, in the field of cultural or aesthetic inquiry, treated as possessing a kind of objectivity. Often it is only the distance of history that allows us to engage in a more critical way with scientific production that has been accepted as neutral in its own time. In tracing the historical continuities of the culturally embedded recognition practices found in AFR methods, we can contest the assumed scientific objectivity of the technological present. All of this to say that in my own inquiry, I used a methodology of analysis that in shorthand I referred to as follow the picture. It's a kind of spin-off of the colloquial, colloquial use of follow the money, a journalistic method of finding the source of influence or intent of a specific phenomenon of investigation. In regards to eigenface, I started to see that through historical images, this paradox of blur, which I observed in its output image, was present in historical images of statistical logic that had been used in practices of recognition through a representation of the face, primarily through photographic representations. And so here, this is one um, kind of, I wouldn't say a source, but another kind of image of the averaged face that was utilized by the anthropologist, scientist, inventor, explorer, Francis Galton, also known as the grandfather of the theory of eugenics in the late 1870s. The context of his use of creating what, is, what he termed the composite portrait was in the study of physiognomy, that is the assessment of a person's character or personality based on their outer appearance, specifically the face or the head. Galton often referred to, again, as the father of eugenics, was interested in discovering physiognomies ranging from medical, uh, medical categories, criminal categories, as well as racial and ethnic. There, this use was connected to the context of the natural sciences, naming and categorizing natural phenomenon based on observation, in this case, applied to the human population. When he was developing this, um, this method of composite portraiture, it, it was at a time when there was a lot of social statistics being developed to be able to kind of grasp, as a form of vision, um, that was beyond the human scale, beyond the individual scale, that can see um, uh, kind of wide trends occurring across a huge demographic as cities were growing and, and um, in population. And it was very difficult to understand what was happening across a huge uh, population without utilizing this uh, method and form of statistics. So, in, it's interesting to think of statistics as a way of, of having kind of visual clarity at a scale that was beyond the human. Um, and so Galton's composites were made by lining up a series of portraits on top of each other like a book, hanging on a wall and positioning them uh, based on the vertical distance between two horizontal lines which ran through the center of the eyes and through the center of the lips. He then took a picture of each image uh, closing the aperture in between, turning the pages, so he would have a photograph of all the pages of portraits on a single photographic plate. Through his experiments, he made some realizations in terms of perceptive qualities based on size, such as the smaller the finished composite portrait was, the clearer the distinction. 
and what by what I mean by distinction, I will I will describe in a second. Um, and this is an example of Galton's um, composite portraits that he made of criminals. And criminal portraits were very accessible for him, and so he would or organize or categorize these composite portraits based on the type of crime that these individuals had done, um, and in this case, uh, larceny. And so for Galton, when he looked at these, what was, what was useful or operational about these composite portraits for Galton was that he saw that there was an averaged face that would appear at the center of the portrait that could define the face of a person who was liable to uh, perform larceny. And so it would be helpful to recognize individuals that would perform larceny based on these composite portraits. And in a way, you can see this correlation between what Faroqui was talking about in his I Machine film about um, you know, ref how different types of algorithmic images refer to a model, to a referent, and that's how the algorithm can recognize what is in the image. And so there's this, this relation to like a predetermined model that can help recognize uh, material physical phenomenon through uh, human vision. Um, so Galton, you know, the, he's had so many different, very interesting observations about this practice of composite portraiture. He had said, you know, this, um, the distinction for Galton was that there was this perce perceptual emergence of an average face. And this process of perceptual emergence involves, quote, extracting the typical characteristics, end quote. And this average face that it would emerge beneath the surface of the image was essentially a picture within a picture and created some form of meaning that was more truer to Galton than individual actual uh, perception of faces. And Thus, Galton's composites produced a portrait of a face which had no non-pictorial reality. And um, he stated or described that the composite was a portrait of a type, not an individual, an imaginary figure possessing the average features of any given group. And this spoke to his larger project and theory of eugenics, that there was a kind of essential truth to a group that could be defined and here visualized through photographic practices and representations of the face. This process, as I see it and understand it, is an antecedent to the eigenface, I mean, in terms of this kind of visual logic of the merging of statistics and vision. And <clears throat> the average face operates in a way where the identity of an individual becomes dependent on a statistical model as its referent. The referent is no longer the original physical face of the individual, rather an imagined and constructed aggregate, a face which does not exist in any pictorial reality. This context is important in terms of uh, that this logic of eugenics and classification, you could say reduction, is inherent to the logic of facial recognition algorithms. And what I wanna present now is just one kind of um, alternative to the same practice of the merging of statistics and facial um, photographic representation. And that, um, that kind of alternative or different kind of meaning in a completely different context is, can be described through this uh, composite portrait that was created by the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein in 1929 based on the practices and methods of Galton. But here <clears throat> in this composite that Wittgenstein made, with the help of his friend, the photographer Moritz Nair, is a composite of four images on the left, which is Wittgenstein and his three sisters, Gretel, Helene, and Hermione. And from this image, Wittgenstein described his concept of family resemblances in relation to his philosophy of the formation of language. And what this composite portrait does in terms of this analysis um, is kind of a direct opposition to the types of meaning that Galton uh, was describing that could be gleaned from this practice. Wittgenstein refers to the composite portrait as, quote, the picture of a probability, end quote, where all manner of possibilities are revealed in the fuzziness. 
Whereas Galton was looking at the composite portrait from a study of physiognomy in hopes of creating a form of taxonomy of the wider human population, Wittgenstein examined the composite portrait from a study of what he termed language games. That is, understanding the primitive forms which make up the everyday use of language. Wittgenstein often relied on images and visual metaphors to realign our understanding to the use of language. His emphasis on vision was often intimately tied to the motivation of conceptual and linguistic clarity. The effort, much of the efforts in his writings is to bring about an ability to see the everyday and the ordinary, otherwise and anew. And, um, you know, it it's kind of relates to this element of surprise. Uh, clarity for Wittgenstein thereby involved a destabilization in familiar modes of perception. His reference to the composite portrait and family resemblances was in its ability to do just this. He used images to destabilize perceptions, making us reimagine language and also have this like kind of inherent utopic possibility. In this case, I'm using Wittgenstein's use of images to reimagine the image. This is particularly visible um, or uh, conveyed through a, a concept that Wittgenstein uh, defined called aspect perception, in which he describes, quote, I contemplate a face, notice a likeness to another. I see that it has not changed, and yet I see it differently, noticing an aspect. The aspect, as he further states, is an internal relation between what we see and other objects. It's a kind of conversion, a reorientation of one's thinking, which he describes as a voluntary interpretive activity. We might say that changing one's way of seeing things is difficult because it is voluntary, because one has to surrender what one has always wanted to see. And something that is more even um, oppositional to the way that Galton was looking at composite portraits was that he, Wittgenstein describes this term of aspect blindness, um, which he describes as an inability to see the jumping from one aspect to another. And having this kind of way of looking that is non-dynamic, continuous seeing, and it's a failure to be struck, again, referring to a reorientation in perception, where one just keeps seeing the same. This description of aspect blindness is very telling of how he understands clarity as a dynamic form of seeing. It's also where I find an almost utmost direct opposition to Galton's conception of clarity in the composite. Because for Galton, it's in the ability on seeing the same that has the most meaning, this emerging average face where clarity is found and where the composite has meaning. Wittgenstein's primary obstacle uh, to investigating language games was what he called our craving for generality and this contemptuous attitude towards the particular case. And so, you know, one of the things that really kind of comes out about this is just how there's this, I mean, obviously in, within these different contexts of uh, social, social, statistics, social statistics and eugenics and then the composite portrait in this kind of context of philosophical description rather than prescription that Galton was working with. And also, I mean, there's another aspect here of Wittgenstein's face being merged with his sister's where you can see all the differences on the outside of the portrait, and also there's a queering of Wittgenstein and seeing himself within different genders of his sisters, um, and there's a, there's a fluidity of identity there. So what kind of really comes out in juxtaposing these two approaches towards this one uh, practice or method of the merging of statistics and vision, I think creates this um, tension between you know, where meaning can be found in terms of the relations between specificity and generality, multiplicity and averaging and statistics. Um, and I think, you know, maybe it's clear through the way I'm talking about this that, you know, the meaning in a contemporary situation or contemporary society of specifically the applications of AFR uh, concern, you know, the transience of a subject and the fluidity of identity, which opposes this kind of um, defining, limiting, and reductive application of statistics to identity that occur through uh, facial recognition technologies. And so, uh, just moving on, I'm going to now bring in how two different um, contemporary artists are working with some of the structures that I have 
defined or described in this analysis of eigenface. And these two contemporary artists are, uh, one of them is Adam Broomberg and Oliver Channerin, which is an artistic duo that um, uh, I will describe this one series called The Spirit of the Bone. Spirit is a bone, and then the work of Zach Blass, who is here today. And I'm going to briefly describe that work just in relation to this analysis uh, specifically. So a great source of contribution in expanding the discussions around the implications, processes, and outcomes of AFR recognition comes from the work of contemporary artists who engage with the technology. Artworks both problematize and reimagine the technology's output while also revealing some really core problematics of its application. So these two series of artworks that I'm going to discuss analyze and, and analyze, utilize some of the same visual logics and structures, recontextualizing this into different forms of visual output. And I think uh, both of them also relate uh, to contemporary notions of representation and identity and, and how this relates to facial recognition technology implementation. So in my research, these artworks act as further sources of theoretical reflection for which to understand implications and processes. And one of the first artworks uh, is a series titled Spirit is a Bone by again, Adam Broomberg and Oliver Channerin. And uh, for this series, these two artists co-opted a facial recognition system that makes use of 3D images and was being used by the Russian government. <clears throat> these 3D images of the face are assembled from multiple photographs to allow individuals to be identified no matter what the angle, expression, or disguise they assume or pose. In order to produce these portraits, four lenses operating in tandem generate a full frontal image of the face producing sort of like a 3D mapping of the face. And this uh, particular method was used by Russian authorities in public security and border control, was designed for crowded areas such as subway stations, railroad stations, stadiums, concert halls, and public areas. And for people resisting, um, it was utilized really for people resisting being photographed, photographed where the subject themselves is unaware of being photographed or being analyzed in the face. So there is no pose, and what is captured is the passivity of the subject. What Broomberg and Channerin really bring out is how this practice is designed to make portraits of a subject without their cooperation. And through this, they inaugurate a term which they borrow from the engineers that develop this particular facial recognition uh, method of the non-consensual portrait. The artists state, quote, there's never a moment in the capturing of the image when, a hu when human contact is registered. The subject's gaze or any connection between photographer and sitter that we would ordinary, ordinarily rely on looking at a portrait is a complete fiction in this space, they state. What we're seeing is the negation of that humanity, the digital equivalent of a death mask, end quote. So co-opting this device, Broomberg and Channerin construct an, a taxonomy of portraits in contemporary Russia. So you can see the title of this uh, particular portrait here is called Society Lady. And the naming of the various different faces by their relation to society is referencing a classic photographic portraiture project of August Sander. So it brings these portraits into a discourse of wider photographic uh, portraiture history. And August Sander created this uh, collection called Citizens of the 20th Century, where he produced over 300 portraits of people during the Weimar Republic based on um, their, uh, their job um, or what they did. Uh, for example, uh, he made portraits titled The Baker, The Farmer, he, and he was really kind of producing these portraits of archetypes in society. But there was also, he, uh, Sander also moved to more marginalized categories with a chapter titled Idiots, the Sick, the Insane, and Matter. Essentially creating, um, yeah, societal archetypes of German citizens. It was really quite creepy. And so, you know, these subjects are positioned uh, center frame in Sanders' work. 
they're also looking into the camera and they're photographed in some ways of being quite heroic in relation to um, in, in how their their kind of their physicality is held up in, within the portrait. And I bring that up because it contrasts very strongly with this series um, by Broomberg and Chanarin, where what you see here is like this contract of photography between photographer and subject, this reciprocity that is broken. And there's a loss of humanity with this gaze that doesn't even register that they are being, that these faces and these individuals are being recorded, um, that their representation is being recorded at all. And this is another uh, image portrait from that series called The Real Estate Agent. Another one is called The Poet. And here is um, a portrait of Katerina Samutsevek from Pussy Riot, uh, titled The Revolutionary. Here is an exhibition uh, image taken of the whole collection of portraits. <clears throat> and so uh, this is interesting to think about in terms of the creation of archetypes and types as a kind of underlying visual logic that, it, that occurs through facial recognition and how it has this, um, this trace of, of both this defining of an individual in relation to society. So the second artwork um, or artist that I wanted to talk about today is Zach Blass, who is another artist focusing on the social and political issues in relation to facial recognition technology. And um, in particular, he's focused on the congruent rise between mass protests by activist groups such as Pussy Riot, Zapatistas in Mexico, the Occupy movement, um, that are occurring at the same time as the increase of facial recognition technologies. And he directly approaches a tension between constructions of identity by the il algorithms of facial recognition and self-generated notions of identity, which can be fluid, changing, and non-reductive, and which defy standardization processes of the former. And in particular, I found his work, uh, Blass's work, so interesting in regards to something that I was describing in regards uh, to Wittgenstein and sort of the, the utilizing of the logic of the mass um, face or like the, the collective excess and how that creates forms um, that oppose averaging or reductive statistical averaging. And um, so Blass's artwork consists of masks that he has made uh, that were produced from uh, recording the faces of uh, multiple individuals from workshops that Blass had organized around different themes of um, marginalization. And the colors of his masks, it was show here, are symbolic that reflect these different groups. And what we see here is really like the, the structural, sculptural and structural form of collective excess and also the subjectivity that references this collective excess and encounters the individualizing recognition of machine, of the machine. Um, as part of Blass's practice, he also ha uh, has um, performances at different kind of really highly surveilled sites of um, uh, surveillance technology. For example, the US-Mexico border. That, and what happens is that these structural forms of collective excess oppose the, um, the surveilling uh, recognition processes of an AFR algorithm. And I don't want to talk too much about it, I think because, you know, Blass is here and he'll talk more about it tomorrow. But I think that uh, this understanding where uh, Blass refers very much to the uh, Haitian post-colonialist theory of Edward Glissant and this concept of opacity and the right to not be read, understood by um, institutional powers is really strong in terms of um, opposing the logics of facial recognition, and really kind of also addresses this tension between generality and specificity, and how also Blass updates this um, concept of opacity and the kind of surveillance uh, society that we live in now with informatic opacity, and the right to not be visible, the right to not be read, the right to not be seen, which is very interesting to think of as, uh, 
in terms of contrasting from the political agency one had in like the 60s or 70s with identity representation as being something that should be visible. So there's a, there's a lot of really interesting kind of shifts going on um, around this thinking. And um, I think my time is coming up, so I just wanted to end with uh, a quote that kind of sums up this analysis in terms of the importance of history and historical tracing of cultural logics in today's technology uh, from Walter Benjamin on his thesis on the philosophy of history and uh, relating to, um, uh, yeah. So his quote of, the past can be seized only as an image which flashes up at the instant when it can be recognized and is never seen again. For every image of the past that is not recognized by the present as one of its own concerns threatens, uh, as, as one of its own concerns, threatens to disappear irretrievably. To articulate the past historically does not mean to recognize it the way it really was. It means to seize hold of a memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger. It is in this spirit that I hold up the eigenface image and the composite portrait as objects of study connected by a relationship in which the past informs the present. The algorithmic processes used in the eigenface method are, embe are embedded with historical practices of racially charged classification, which makes clear the present danger posed by AFR technology and suggests a critique of its limitations and entanglements with regards to notions of recognition and identity. Tracing the historical link between the practice of composite portraiture and the representational mechanism within the eigenface algorithm also reveals a link between discourses on the role of the image in science and art and the forms of representation that are found in current algorithmic processes. Thank you so much for your attention and time.